It's My Nerd World, a Depeche Mode podcast, the incredibly infrequent look at all things Depeche Mode. It's been a while since I've recorded a show, but there hasn't been a lot to talk about. However, we do have things to talk about today, including the band working on new music. I have the details. Plus, we'll uh, go through a review, a bit of a breakdown of the full Blu-ray release of Spirits in the Forest. The show is brought to you by MyNerdWorld.net, where you can find out all things about this podcast, the other podcasts from My Nerd World, and the Embark Science Fiction Space Opera series. If you are a sci-fi fan, and you must be a Depeche Mode fan because you're listening to this podcast, you do not want to miss out on the Embark series. I'll have more details at the end of the show this week. Let's get to it. Nerd World, the Depeche Mode podcast, and I am your host, John Justice. I'm glad you are once again uh, with the show, and I'm sorry it has been so long since I have sat down to talk about all things in the world of Depeche Mode. Um, I really don't have a good excuse. I have had a lot going on in life. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the world, to say the least. I don't need to tell you, and I'm not talking about it on this show because I want to have a good time. I don't want to get depressed. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of news when it comes to Depeche Mode. Um, I've been planning on doing a show for a while now, especially with the release of the the physical release of Spirits in the Forest, which was delayed because of the pandemic. Oh, no, wait. I, like, I went and I talked about it. Um, it was delayed, but it finally came out. I got my hands on it. It's in my hand right here. I got it in my hand, um, and I'm really excited to share my thoughts with you about the full, the full release of Spirits in the Forest, uh, the Blu-ray, which includes the uh, the live soundtrack discs, uh, the Blu-ray of the full concert uh, f- from Berlin, and of course the movie, uh, the movie as well. But before we get to that, let's get to the bigger news, and the bigger news is Peter Gordino who is sort of unofficially a member of the band, right? Um, He's been obviously a part of the tour now for a long, long time. And I didn't realize until getting this piece of information that Peter Gordino was this involved in the music creation process, which I find really fascinating. But before I dive into it, the deal is the band's working on new music. And this is really how we end up finding out about this as fans, right? If you are brand new to the show, um, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to previous episodes. Um, I know I talk a lot about my books, but selling books is hard. (laughs) Um, But I would really go back and listen to previous episodes of the Depeche Mode podcast. And um, especially some of those early episodes where I break down my history of of my fandom with uh, with the band. Uh, The podcasts that I do here on My Nerd World are... Um, Star Wars on a weekly basis and Depeche Mode. And those two things in my life are two of the biggest pop culture things that had the biggest impact on me from a child uh, until I got older. Uh, I was a fan of Star Wars at five years old, seeing in the theater before I was a fan of anything else. And I was a fan of Depeche Mode before I was a fan of really any other band. Um, I listened, obviously, to other music, uh, but it wasn't until I heard Shake the Disease for the first time that I... I, I realized how powerful music can be and what a driving force and how influential it can be in your life, what a friend music can be, um, what a comfort music can be, how exhilarating music can be. And Depeche Mode has been a massive, massive part of my life um, ever since uh, that first day sitting in my, uh, my, my bedroom as a kid listening to K-Rock in California, hearing Shake the Disease, and then wanting to get my hands on every single piece of Depeche Mode music that I could possibly get my hands on, and it's been that way for me for me ever since. Um, so, that being said, this is how we usually find out about the band working on new music. They very rarely make any... In fact, I can't even tell you the last time Depeche Mode actually came out and made like a major announcement they were creating new music. Usually, you know, we get wind of it, And I think the band likes to keep it that way. Uh, Maybe in the early days they did announce it more, but certainly in the 
in the latter part or the middle part of their career, I would say from like Music for the Masses um, and then Violator onwards, because that's really at a time when we were able to 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 get information more readily, especially when the band was going in studio. We in studios, we didn't have to wait for certain publications to to print it. Certainly, when you get into the Songs of Faith and Devotion era, and then into the Exciter era with the internet, we would find out when they were booking studio time. I think the band really likes to have that flexibility to not really be stuck to any set deadline. And so over the course of the past 20 years or so, it really has been when the band ends up in studio, we find out they're working on new music or through an interview like this. So here is what we know. And I have to thank uh, Depeche Mode Dispatch on Facebook for um, for uh, doing a uh, for transcribing this interview. Um, Peter Gordino was interviewed um, by UPC Universidad, and I'm not even going to try the rest of this, uh, Manuel uh, Garrido Leca, and I'm, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, they had a very nice chat about Peter's career as a keyboard player, producer, and songwriter, mainly addressed to the students of the UPC Music School. The live stream was, uh, of course, followed by many devotees who asked him about the future of Depeche Mode, especially in light of the last day's rumors regarding a new album and tour. So here's what Gordino had to say. At the moment, writing for the next Depeche, Depeche Mode record is my main concern. I've been starting doing that. Christian and I, Christian Iger, uh, work together on music and send it out to Dave in New York. And he likes to get down on the lyric side. Christian's got a great studio in Vienna, where he lives. I just go over there for a couple of weeks, and we literally just jam. I'll get the best ideas when I feel... I'll get my best ideas when I feel relaxed. He's a phenomenal drummer, and he's actually a very creative keyboard player as well. We've had a couple of nice tracks on the last record, and hopefully we'll get some stuff going on this one. At the moment... I'm writing some stuff, some of it for Dave, some of it for probably other stuff, but I'm not really sure what it'll be. We'll have to see. Uh, when asked about Depeche Mode recording a new album this year, um, is probably unlikely just because I can't imagine a time when we're going to get everyone into studio, but me and Christian, as I said, have been doing stuff. I know Martin's been in the studio, and he's been writing a few things. At the moment, we're assuming there, there will be a record, but we wouldn't know when it's going, going to be. We've got a lot of time on our hands, and we're all bored, so hopefully we can open up and we can go, oh, look, we've got 12 great songs. I think that would be the best thing. So with a bit of luck, as soon as it's humanly possible, we'll have enough songs to get something done. Um, look, this is obviously really exciting news for, for us Depeche Mode fans. Um, I am confident that the band is going to go and put out another album. I, I really wasn't not confident. I, I really had an expectation that this was going to happen anyways. It seems as if the band still has another album or two in them. I think the touring aspect of what they're doing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into the spirits of the of the forest review. Um, I think the touring aspect of it may change a bit. You know, the look, the guys are getting older. There's just there's absolutely no no denying that. Um and it's it's a miracle that we still have Dave gone here with us. I mean let's let's be honest. Uh I, I, I was just watching the the concert from the Spirits in the Forest uh Blu ray as I sat down to uh to put together the notes for the show and just, you know, stopping for a moment and watching Dave, you know, doing Cover Me or or Poison Heart and and uh, thinking a bit about his 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 recent stage presence style, and I'll get into that a bit coming up. But just seeing the guy on stage, seeing the man on stage, and just thinking, my gosh, you know how many how many stories are there of of rock stars who went down the path that day that Dave did back in the '90s and lived to tell the tale. I, I just it's it's amazing to me, and he's been able to stay clean all these years. I mean, it, he. You know, not only does the band make obviously amazing music, right? Um, music that's touched millions upon millions of, of fans, but Dave's story and all their stories are really unique and special. You know, this is—it's an understatement to say 
that this band is truly amazing on 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 as i said so many different levels the the demons that these guys have tackled throughout their career and 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 the fame and the fandom and the fact that they're still making music together um it, it really is inspiring and it's incredible and i know look and i know it inspires me uh i don't make music well look i make some music i mean this was this was mine <laughs> i made that uh, but that was really just a ripoff of Useless that I used in GarageBand on, on my Mac. Uh, and I only use that because I keep getting dinged every time on the podcast when I put in official Depeche Mode music. So that's why I don't. Um, but no, I mean, they've been an inspiration to me just to try new things. Right? To always forge ahead and don't don't be afraid of, you know, to and, 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 to, and to not be afraid of trying something new and different. Um, I was inspired in writing my science fiction stories because of George Lucas and Star Wars, um, but I'm not going to lie, and I'll, I'll talk about it at the end of the show, uh, Depeche Mode was a part of that because the main protagonist in the story, a character that I named Taft Guardia, uh, is a massive Depeche Mode fan. I mean, he's basically an avatar of me, and I wanted to write a story about a young guy reflecting on me when I was young at the height of my Depeche Mode fandom. I wanted to write a story about how emotional, like from a, an emotional standpoint, what that guy would be like, because I know how I was and what Taft would be like. It's set in the future, but I, I have a, a mechanism in the story where the the popular music of the time in the future is the era that's that's around the time when Depeche Mode makes music now, right, and, and, and the 90s and 80s. Um, so, you know, I found inspiration in this character and it's not just the fact that he's a Depeche Mode fan. It really does sort of mold his personality and how he relates to people and how he, um, how he views the world and romance. And, um, so, I mean, Depeche Mode has impacted my life in so many different ways and it's just, it's amazing. And the fact that the band may be looking to make, or is going to be making new music, it just, it gets me so excited at a time when there's not a lot of things to be excited about. Uh, the one thing I want to mention, and then we'll the, the the other thing I wanted to mention about this, and then we'll get into um, the review of of Spirits in the Forest, and I've got a lot of different comments to to make on that. Is I'm I'm obviously incredibly curious to know what the the themes are going to be on this album, what the musical themes are. Um, I do love the album Spirit. Um, I don't particularly care for some of the more overtly political messages the band used. Um, it's fine. I I, I prefer the you know the songs of faith and devotion. You know, uh, you know the the pain and suffering in various in various tempos. That's more of my speed of Depeche. But you know, I've liked some of the more political leaning stuff they've done in the eighties, and you know, and I can and I can really ignore and push back a lot of of any sort of um, bias that may creep in because of the content. Um, I know where the band is politically, and that's cool. What you know, that's fine by me. Um, but I want more songs about, you know, about those those more emotional aspects, less about the world around me. That being said, um, I think there's a really good possibility that we can get an album that might touch upon some older themes, especially from Martin Gore's point of view. Um, just from the fact of we've all been in isolation so much during this pandemic, um, you know, you you write from what you know. And I think that the last album, Spirit, was really written from a place of where the guys were at the time, especially Martin with everything going on uh, in, in Europe because of Brexit, obviously everything going on here in America with the, you know, he lives in Santa Barbara. Um, so that obviously had an, an influence on him. And I can't help but wonder, and for as weird as it sounds, I get a little giddy thinking about, man, with the pandemic going on in isolation, this could really tap into some good lyrical content coming from coming from Martin Gore. So that's exciting. I, and I don't see them going back to do another politically themed album. I just, I, 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 they didn't do it in the past. You know, you go back to some of those eighties records and you had a bit of that. Um, but they really stuck to more of those core, you know, love lust themes, um, that I, I just can't imagine them going down that road again, but I could be wrong. You know, I could be wrong. And it sounds like I'm being down on spirit. I'm really not. There's a lot of tracks on that that I absolutely love. There's just a couple of them that are just a little bit too on the nose for me and I can't really relate to them. But that's like that with every single Depeche Mode album. I would be very curious to know what, what you think. Email me, uh, the John Justice, the John Justice, and that's J O N. I got a new email address, uh, the John Justice at gmail.com. And I'd be curious. Um, what you would like to see, what are your expectations for a new, for a new Depeche Mode album? What kind of themes would you like to see the band, uh, tackle? Uh, would you, 
Do you want to see them continue to move forward with sort of this blues, electronic, uh, live uh, instrument sort of hybrid they've been doing over the past few years? Or would you prefer to see them going back to more of their traditional roots of a drum machine and more, you know, maybe even analog based, but electronic based? I know that's what I would like to see. I'd love for them to do sort of a modern take on the the sound that they crafted during that that trilogy era of music for the masses, Violator, and Songs of Faith and Devotion, and more particularly Violator and Music for the Masses. I'd, I'd like to see maybe a return to that. I don't want to go nostalgia, and we'll talk about nostalgia in a minute, but I'd like to see what they could do now with a little bit less live instrumentation. But email me, thejohnjustice at gmail.com, and let me know what uh, what you think. All right, let's get into Spirits in the Forest. Um, I'm not going to get into the movie review. I covered the movie on a previous podcast, and so if you're curious to get my thoughts on the uh, on the Anton Corbin film interspersed with the, uh, the live concert footage, uh, go and seek out that uh, earlier uh, podcast, and you'll get my full thoughts, uh, my full thoughts there. Um, so I got the packaging here in front of me, and uh, I've got some notes here I want to share with you. Uh, and again, you know, if at any point you want to, I, I do want to hear from you, and, and I'd like to continue doing the podcast, but a lot of that's just based off of material and things to talk about. Um, I am on, I am planning on going through at some point and um, doing individual podcasts based off of some of the physical live releases. I just haven't gotten to that point because I've been busy um, writing my stories and, and working on the other podcast and the full-time job as well. So let's start off with the packaging in and of itself, and we'll just kick off with the artwork. I've made a lot of comments about Anton Corbin's artwork during this particular era, and I think it's top-notch. Um, Anton is very different. He's, you know, he, he's got have a very distinct style. Any Depeche Mode fan knows Anton's work the moment you see it, uh, and this is no different. He's added a little bit more art with these ghosts, right, the spirits on the cover, but I really do like the artwork this time around. Um, I thought that Anton did a really good job. It's minimal, it's sparse, but it it says Depeche Mode. Uh, I'm not thrilled over the Digipack gatefold. Um, I, I don't know what else I would have liked to have seen in the packaging, because if you go with the sort of traditional hard plastic um, releases with the discs that are on sort of the the harder folds where they where they where they lock in. Those tend to break quite a bit. Um, I've just never been a huge fan of the um, of the digipacks. Um, you know, it's not bad, but again, I, I would have preferred something maybe a cross between the two—a hard shell on the outside that opens up and folds up on the uh, on the inside. Uh, the booklet itself is pretty. Uh, I always like the booklets, but there's nothing too too special. You get some some Anton Corbin photographs, which is always a good thing. I love Anton's work across the board, whether it's his video work or obviously his uh, his photography. And uh, the booklet doesn't disappoint in giving us some really good visuals as I sort of uh, thumb thumb through it. You get some classics in here with the um, with the two fingers together for World in My Eyes. You know, harkening back to the original you know nineteen ninety ninety one um artwork. Um, so yeah, the the booklet's cool. I dig it. Um, you get to the back, and of course we have the liner notes, and this is where we'll get into a bit of the um, a bit of the performance and the set list. So, um, I'll 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 give out a little bit of nitpicks here and there. Overall, I really like the concert. Okay, um, it's uh, it's one of the best for a while. I think I like it better than Live in Berlin. Uh, the Live in Berlin one would have been great if Anton had released it proper in a Blu-ray on HD. I know you can get it digitally, but I got the DVD disc, and it's almost unwatchable because of the the quality of the footage and the lines in the in the imagery that we that we get during it. Um, the quality, the video quality on uh, the Barcelona um, for Sounds of the Universe tour for Tour of the Universe is great, um, but I'm not the biggest fan of that particular concert. Um, so this one here is one of the best of the last few, I, for me personally. I like the performance better. I like the set list better. I like the visuals better. My only complaint up front is that I wish the first half of the concert wasn't in daylight. And I know it's a nitpick, and it seems like a really odd choice. I mean, obviously, for whatever reason, the band wanted to record the live portion of this, or maybe Anton did, in Berlin. Um Maybe because of the crowd and how raucous the crowd was, because the crowd's really good in this in this particular performance. Um, but the fact that the first half of the concerts in daylight drives me a little nuts. I'm not going to lie. 
Uh, and that's mostly because I've been to so many concerts throughout the years that a band playing in daylight is always indicative of an opening act. And the performance and the visuals and the lighting for a Depeche Mode show, it's incumbent on it being dark. And so the stage presence is great and the band is great, but just those first... You know, those 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 first five or six songs, while it's still bright outside, it just it takes me a bit out of the out of the experience for me. It doesn't ruin it completely. But that's just again, a bit of a nitpick. Um, The visuals are awesome for this tour. I think the lighting is some of the best that they've done. Um, I know we've got basically one big screen. You get the um, you get the riser that Dave gets to get to stand up on behind. But um, I think the visuals work great. I think Anton's uh, movies are are pretty are pretty solid this time around. They're they're getting a little weird. The barn animals and the dogs and stuff is a little strange, <laughs> but it's funny. I think it's more indicative of me getting older than it is Anton doing anything different. I think when I was younger, perhaps I was a little bit more accepting of the abstract. Um, it's not bad. It doesn't take me out of it. It's just you know you get these visuals and you're so used to particular vid- visuals on certain songs and then you go with like you know you go with roosters and and dogs and you just kind of scratch your head going all right anton i'm not sure what you're trying to convey here but let's go with it but even that footage given sort of the anton corbin stamp is is really interesting um i want to stop really quick and i just want to make a comment uh so i've i've got a fourth book in my science fiction series in the works it's a spin-off book um it's going to be really relevant to Depeche Mode fans. Uh, I don't want to ruin any, anything for anybody. Um, I introduce a character in the third book of the trilogy. Uh, that book came out uh, about about a month and a half ago. Uh, so we have book one, and then we have uh, book two, Treasure in Darkness, and then book three is A Vanishing War. And that completes sort of the full story arc of the opening trilogy of my science fiction series. I introduce a character, uh, and I'll give you a bit of a... Uh, I'll give you a. I'll give you a little bit. Uh, the 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 character in the book used to be a musician. Okay, I don't want to spoil anything, but you being a Depeche Mode fan, uh, and I will definitely let you know when it's when 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 it's a, when it's available. Uh, when you when you see the title of the book, you're gonna laugh. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say, uh, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you do pick up book three, um, I do give the title of the next book. At the back of the, at the end of the book, um, as a, as a, as a, you know, sort of coming soon, this book. Um, and also, if you read the story, you'll know exactly the character I'm talking about. So that's just a bit of a tease. Again, if you're a science fiction fan, be sure to check those books out because selling books is hard and uh, it helps when I can talk about them on my podcast. All right. Uh, the music, the music's fantastic. I do have one complaint though, and I would love to hear from you if uh, you notice the same thing. Some of the tracks feel slower for some reason. Especially a pain that I'm used to in World in My Eyes. Now, I've actually had this issue with World in My Eyes before, and I don't know if it's because the main beat... I don't know if it's because that beat plays mind tricks on me because there'll be times when I'll listen to it and it sounds fine and other times when I listen to it and it sounds slower. But for some reason, the live performance of World in My Eyes and especially A Pain That I'm Used To, it just feels like it's, you know, if it was like normally at 10, it feels like it's at 9. The vocals sound fine, but for some reason, it, it's it's really, really odd. Also, I want to mention this while while I'm in this spot of just talking about some things that stuck out to me. And I would be curious to know if you if you felt the same thing. Uh, Martin is fantastic in this live performance. On Stripped, though, Martin's backing vocals, they seem to be off by like a beat. It's really weird. Again, it's not enough to where it ruins the song and all, but it's enough to where this fan goes... That seems off time for some reason. It's really, really odd. I'd like to know if you picked up on the same thing. Again, uh, the John Justice, J O N, the John Justice at uh, gmail.com. Uh, let me know if you noticed that as well or anything else you might have noticed. All right, let's get into Dave for a minute. Let's talk a little Dave Gone. Uh, Dave vocals are great. Um, his voice has obviously changed throughout the years. Um, I, uh, it's better than, it, than it's the. Tour of the Universe, live in Barcelona one, um, live Blu-ray. 
Um, there were some moments in that where Dave was really, really nasally on, on several tracks. And it just never sounded right. Um, on Live in Berlin and certainly The Spirits in the Forest, this one, um, his vocals are, 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 are spot on. They're totally fine to me. He's, he's doing some different stuff on different songs than he's done before. I mean, Dave has always kind of switched things up. I mean, g- gone are the days of more of a straightforward Dave gone, just singing the lyrics as close to the album as they were before. Dave definitely now likes to mess with his voice and change up his his pitch and change up certain elements of certain songs, and I'm totally, totally okay with that. I kind of dig it. I mean, as somebody who's been a lifelong Depeche Mode fan, to have Dave go and change it up a bit is, is fine because we can always go back to to you know, the the past Dave gone and watch those previous concerts, whether it's, you know, 101, whether it's devotional, uh, whether it's um, One Night in Paris, you know, we, we can always go back and, and check out the 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 younger, I'm excuse me, the younger Dave gone to get that. Um, he certainly has changed his stage presence. This is, this is an older, because Dave is older, this is an older Dave gone and playing that performance and role of more of a, for lack of a better word, sort of sleazy performer. It's got more of an Elvis vibe to it. Um, And again, it's not a bad thing. Uh, I prefer younger Dave, but I also know that this is Dave now. And he's still an amazing performer. And he still is an amazing singer. And he does dance a little different. And he does have a much different a much different swagger to him. Um, but it is what it is. And I still dig it. It's different, but I dig it. I know a lot of people are complaining about it. And I I saw some comments online and I think the big reason why is because Depeche Mode suffers the same thing that Star Wars suffers from. It suffers from nostalgia for the older fans that grew up with the band. Um, there's a certain there's a certain nostalgia feeling that you get listening to Depeche Mode or watching Depeche Mode. And there's something really magical that happens when you're watching a Depeche Mode performance and for example, like I mentioned before, seeing the visual of the two hands together making the eyes for a world in my eyes, right? Um seeing some of the visuals that Anton Corbin has used throughout the years. Um, hearing particular songs, they they elicit emotions and, and, and nostalgic feelings and all that. And I think that often on a subconscious level for some fans, when that nostalgia doesn't show up in their feelings, when it doesn't arrive, it's unsettling for some people. This is just my sort of um, non, you know, having no psychology background hot take on it. I, I, I really do think that Depeche Mode suffers a a bit from that. You know, I mean, look, if you go into any of the forums, if you go into the Halo forum or any of the other Depeche Mode forums or you go online to Twitter and you look through some threads, you know, I mean, when you get new Depeche Mode music, it's always kind of compared to the classic stuff. And that's never, ever going to going to change. I don't necessarily like to complain. I like to stick to the positive stuff. I've had my little nitpicks on here. But none of this is enough for to ruin to, for it to ruin any of the experience for me. I still sit back with a big smile on my face, clap and sing along when I'm watching, um, you know, the live when I'm watching the concert. Even if it is a different Dave Gone, and even if it is he does have a a different swagger, and even if he is choosing to let the crowd sing particular uh, particular parts of songs that he didn't do before, I'm just so grateful that we still have Dave Gone up there performing on stage. After all of these uh, years, um, he, you know, he's he's an amazing and inspiring individual. Um, getting back to Martin Gore for a second. Look, Martin's always fantastic, man. The dude's just awesome. I mean, Dave and Martin both are. Uh, Fletcher's Fletcher. You know, he's there. You know, you 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 just there's 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 Andrew Fletcher. That's cool. <laughs> he's always going to be a part of the band. There's never much to say about him. Um, you know, but he's great. Dave and Martin are the, you know, are the band, but it wouldn't be the same without, without, you know, Andrew Fletcher. Uh, but Martin's fantastic. His vocals are amazing. Um, the tracks that he does on this particular show, uh, doing things you said and insight when we talk about, or when I talk about nostalgia, both of those songs just hit right in that sweet spot, man. 
You get you get an older Martin Gore singing things you said, and you're just immediately propelled back to 101. I mean, I I'm taken all the way back to when I went to the Rose Bowl. I was at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, and Martin, you know, a young Martin Gore uh, singing that, and a 17 year old John Justice watching him, um, and then to hear Insight. I was immediately propelled back to the ultra era. And that doesn't happen very often. And I was. And I was like, man, I got these really cool nostalgic feelings for that ultra era. And the the one-off shows they did at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles and the one in London, um, you know, leading up to the singles tour and that album and the fact that we were so grateful at the time that Dave actually made it through his overdose and his heroin addiction. They put another 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 album out and... And it's inside, which is, you know, kind of a deep track for most people. Um, but it's a, it's a highlight. Um, the other highlight for me for the, for the concert is Heroes. I love Heroes. Uh, I think that Dave and the band do an amazing, amazing job with that song. And I was never really a fan of that song uh, outside of Depeche Mode doing their cover version of it. But I really, really love what they do Um in the uh, in the live setting with the visuals and the guitar work and Dave's vocals of it and you can tell Dave is really really passionate behind you know singing that singing that song you can tell that he just he loves to sing that he loves to sing that song um look over the set list a bit you know uh, look the tracks are great the fact that they used you, the track list is great the set list is great the fact that they pulled out Useless, um, I love the version of World in My Eyes, even if it does sound a little slower. Uh, Cover Me is a massive um, favorite of mine, as is Poison Heart. Um, Where's the Revolution comes off a little flat live. Um, I love the song. It just doesn't seem to have the oomph for the live. you know. And then you get into the classics, Enjoy the Silence, and Never Let Me Down. And of course, I Want You Now. That's another nostalgic classic. Um, and even this time around, you, you get to the end and you do your walking in my shoes, which is great personal Jesus and the wrap up as they have liked to do on so many tours of going back to just can't get enough. Um, it used to really annoy me. It doesn't anymore. Um, I'm not a fan of that. I was never a fan of that song of just can't get enough. I understand its importance in Depeche Mode's history. Don't misunderstand. Um, but going to see them live, it's like, I, I'm like, okay, whatever. For whatever reason though, I've gotten over that. And even when I saw them a couple of years back when they played in Chicago on this particular tour, you know, it, it was cool to hear just can't get enough. You know, you, you just it is it is what it is. And the band understands that. And, you know, it's a part of their history. So I totally, totally understand why uh, they still choose to go and do that. It's just it's a cra- it's a crowd favorite. What do you think? I really want to hear from you. I'd like to know your thoughts um, on on potential new music what you're hoping the band does on the live performance. Uh, was I too nitpicky? I didn't want to be... I really do love it. Look, I, look I'm look, i so happy. I can't tell you. Whenever I get a new physical Depeche Mode release, um, I'm like a little kid. I, I just love it. Um, I didn't want to be not objective about it. You know, those are just my little grievances. But I'll be going back and watching this live concert. This will probably be my live concert go-to for a while now with the band. Um, cause I really think the performance is great. The set list is great. The visuals are great apart from the beginning where it's in daylight. Um, you know, Dave is sauntering around on the stage in typical modern older Dave style. And that's okay. Cause I can always go back and watch those other, those other concerts as well. But I love to hear from you. Uh, the John justice at gmail.com talk show nerd at gmail.com still works, but I'm going with the uh, John justice. Now uh, I want to do a quick shout out to Neil Gregory. He reached out to me on Facebook just this week and said, Hey man, when are you going to do another show? Uh, and I told him I would, and I didn't, uh, I didn't lie. So thanks for checking the show out. Um, we're going to wrap things up before I do though. Uh, now that we're done, you're welcome to, to leave. Um, I do want to talk for just a moment about my science fiction uh, novels and um, why this could be uh, something good for you, especially during this pandemic, if you're still dealing with lockdown orders and uh, a lack of new material, if you are a science fiction fan um, and obviously a Depeche Mode fan, uh, I I hope you'll go to mynerdworld.net or go to amazon.com and search for John J-O-N Justice uh, and look for the Embark Trilogy. For those that aren't familiar with these stories, here's the quick breakdown of the three uh, of the three books. Um, in Embark Book One, it's a science fiction adventure set in the future. It tells the story of a boy, a Depeche Mode fan, who's in love with a girl in the middle of the apocalypse. The greatest technological advancement ever made has gone missing. Earth is at risk, and the hunt is on to find the only hope for humanity's survival. Flight culture has replaced car culture. 
Earth is facing the apocalypse, and Tapped Guardia will fight with his friends to save humanity and the girl he loves. Um, the trilogy is an exciting space opera for those who love movies. Uh, it's a mix of Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, Fast and Furious, and Ready Player One, all in one fast-paced epic trilogy. In book two, after having survived a planet-wide apocalypse on Earth, Taft and his friends on a far-off world must now unravel the mystery of a lethal threat to their new way of life on their new homeworld. And then the story wraps up in book three. The only way the Raider Alliance can stop a ruthless galactic dictator is with the truth. The question is, will humanity in a far-off galaxy believe them? The stories are good for all ages. I've got uh, 11, uh, 11 years old to 80, uh, 80 years old who have loved uh, these stories. It's a classic good versus evil uh, tale, and it is great for all ages. Um, again, it's tailored for adults, but you know it's got the fun and adventure of Star Wars. So if you've got kids who like Star Wars, you know these books uh, will suit them uh, just fine. And like I said, you being a Depeche Mode fan, if you like sci-fi, be sure just check out book one. You know, book one is the entry into the series. Uh, it's written from the perspective in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture. And the main protagonist is a massive uh, Depeche Mode fan. He's a lovelorn Depeche Mode fan. And there's a lot of Depeche Mode references in the book. Uh, you definitely won't be disappointed. So again, go to mynerdworld.net or head on over to amazon.com and you can pick up the ebook, the paperback, or the audiobooks narrated by yours truly, that would be me, um, on Amazon or mynerdworld.net. All right, that wraps up this show. I hope to hear from you, thejohnjustice at gmail.com. I hope you are surviving well in this world we live in and with life in general. And hopefully uh, you'll be hearing again from me very, very soon. And I look forward to hearing from you. Talk to you later. Bye. My Nerd World.